first of all, I wanted to say thank you for having us at Unite and so that we're able to give this webinar about V materials. And yeah, we are very happy to talk about our high quality texture map creation for photorealistic materials. My name is Rudi Garab. I'm the product manager of V materials and I'm also a technical artist. With me is Mike Roland, who is our photogrammetry expert and the texture artist. So today we will talk about MDL and I will be giving a short introduction into MDL. And Mike will talk about the capturing and photogrammetry process as well as his texture preparation with Art Engine. And in the end we will give and we will show some practical uh, material examples of some of the materials that we have created with MDL. So what are V-Materials? The V-Materials catalog is a library of more than 2,150 materials for AEC and design, which is authored in MDL, which is NVIDIA's material definition language. The latest version of the V-Materials catalog, version 1.7, has just been released and it can be downloaded at no cost from the NVIDIA website. So if you want to give it a try, just go there. Uh, NVIDIA vMaterials can be used in any applications that has MDL support enabled, such as V-Ray, NVIDIA Omniverse, Siemens NX, SolidWorks Visualize, Substance Designer, uh, all the iRay plugins for 3ds Max, Maya, or Rhino, uh, and it also works in DAS 3D. So when we design a new material for our catalog, we first think so what's the special feature we would like to add to the material? So what makes it stand out from the crowd? So from those materials that just provide typically one single look. We want our materials to cover a whole range of appearances so users can change the state that the material is in, which in turn changes the appearance and the character of the material as well. So on the sphere on the left, you see a polished copper material. However, this material has controls for aging and wearing out the material, and you can even gradually grow a layer of oxidized copper on top. What you see on these four spheres is the very same materials with different parameter settings. With MDL, we are able to create these materials very effectively, uh, since you can describe how light interacts with your geometry. You can define how light reflects, refracts, or is transmitted. And what's most useful is that we can layer these effects, which allows us to create materials of any visual complexity without having to think about limitations or sacrificing visual fidelity. So you can always add another layer on top of your material and you can drive the appearance of each layer independently from the others. Uh, here's a practical of example of what that looks like if we create a very simplistic car paint material. Uh, first, we start off with the diffuse base color, which gives us the basic shading. Next, we want to make this material more fancy, so we add a bit of reflection on top. However, this reflection layer is driven by procedural texture, which generates procedural flakes that are pointing in different directions, and this creates the appearance of shiny metal flakes. Now we want to add a clear coat layer on top, which we can do by simply blending a BSDF that models the reflections of the clear coat. Since we want the clear coat not to be too perfect, we can use a texture to generate uh, surface normals, which drive the normal of the clear coat layer. All the other layers remain unaffected of these layers. So the scratches are just affecting the clear coat. And in the end, we place a layer of dirt on top, which is modeled by another diffuse reflection, which gives the material a nice, dirty and worn look. The dirt layer uses its own bump map, which is just affecting the dirt layer. So this was basically a, <laughs> a quick and dirty example of how to build and layer a material with MDL. So what is MDL exactly? The NVIDIA material definition language is a technology developed by NVIDIA to define uh, physically based materials for physically based rendering solutions. It has a strong specification with a focus for material exchange. So any materials that you create can be loaded in any MDL enabled rendering applications. And typically, you know, like you're guaranteed to have the same look of those materials. MDL is designed to be rendering algorithm agnostic that means that we define what to compute 
but not how to exactly to compute it. And you will see in one of the next slides what it exactly means. It works very well on high performance GPUs. So good news for everyone who owns a beefy uh, Nvidia card. The key for its design is the separation into two fundamental parts. Uh, note that this is a simplified explanation. However, I find it's important to explain how that roughly works. So we have a declarative material definition that defines what kind of material we want to render. And this is a predefined structure with inputs where we can define what light interactions take place, such as reflections, refractions, light emissions, subsurface scattering, and so on. We have access to the geometry, which allows us to implement displacement, or we can modify the surface normal. Then we also have the procedural language, programming language, and that allows us to access v coordinate, UV coordinates of our geometry, for example. We can transform them, we can do texture lookups, we can generate procedural textures, and so on. Then we can use these results to tint reflections or refractions. We can modify the glossiness of the material or of one of the layers inside of our material. We can change the surface normal, just to name a few typical use cases. And this all can be expressed with written code, which is being fed as input to the material. So with this information, we can provide this material to uh, the rendering application and depending on what type of rendering engine is working there, you know, the renderer is choosing how this material is exactly implemented and depending on whether it's a rasterizer, a ray tracer or path tracer, um, you have a different approach for doing so. Um, the basic building blocks of a material are BSDFs. I've already mentioned them when I was uh, talking about the car paint example. And the BSDF is the abbreviation for bidirectional scattering distribution function. So uh, these are mathematical functions that describe how light behaves when it interacts with the geometry. And these light interactions can be split up into several basic types that are expressed with these BSDFs. And on, on these images on the slide, you can see how these BSDFs look like when they're just rendered isolated. So the diffuse reflection, I think most people are known with that type of look. The specular reflection gives us a mirror or chrome-like look. Then we have also glossy reflections. We have backscattering glossy, which allows us to model retroreflective materials. We have diffuse transmission BSDF for modeling paper or leaves. And we have specular reflection and transmission for uh, modeling glass-like materials. When you build a material, you can mix and layer these BSDFs. I think most of you are familiar with Photoshop. You know, like there you can mix, blend, and combine layers together until you have a complete image. Uh, building a material in NDL is somewhat similar to this approach. However, you're doing some sort of advanced compositing that is taking light interaction into account, and you are able to do much more than simple layering in Photoshop. And these BSDFs that you see here is what you use more than 90% of the time. But for the sake of completeness, uh, the, I want to mention the other types that we have as well. And there are the EDFs, the so-called emission distribution functions that allow you to make materials emit light. So the material is basically acting as a light source. And we also have volume distribution functions that describe how light is being scattered inside a volume. So with all this, you can go ahead and create your glowing lava material if you want to. And having all these functions, now you can build a material by combining those. So using multiple BSDFs allows us to model complex materials. And one example is this silk material where you can see the isolated BSDFs on the left side and the results of when they are combined on the right hand side. So I know that this was a lot of information, but we have been just scratching the surface. And for those of you who are interested in diving deeper, I can recommend you the MDL handbook, which can be viewed and even downloaded from mdlhandbook.com. And it gives a great uh, explanation of how MDL works and of MDL in general. 
So you can imagine that textures, uh, they play a vital role in the process of material authoring. Um, they are for the main ingredient for our materials and they add life to them. Otherwise, our materials would look clean, sterile and basically lifeless. Um, we have a setup for efficient and time-saving uh, capturing process and uh, for building the textures that you see on these materials. So now I will give the presentation to Mike Roland, who is our expert for photogrammetry and texturing in general, and he will walk you through his workflow and how he is capturing and generating the textures that make our materials feel real. Thank you, Rüdiger. Here we have my equipment for the capturing process. There is a lot of information on the internet already about how to capture and how to run the photogrammetry. That is why I will explain only certain tools. Let us start with the tripod. This one has an extra feature. You can switch the middle stand to 90 degrees. And that's how the, the camera is facing down to the ground. It is a good option if, if you capture ground surfaces. And you already have the, the correct angle for the capturing process. Uh, yeah, that, that helps you with uh, with neck pain. <laughs> and uh, also the, the remote control is a good friend while capturing for people who have shaky hands. And it also speeds up the, the process too. There's nothing better than, than having comfort when you are outside on a material adventure. So here we go with the two folding rulers. Um, they organize the area I want to capture while I shoot in a, in a meandering way. You may miss the line and the folding rulers help to stick uh, on, on the right line. So it's, it's having, it's like having a grid and you have a good orientation. And uh, yeah, what you also see there is, is an extra lens uh, that I like to carry with me. It is a cross polarized filter. This one I use when I capture shiny materials. This, uh, this reduces the, the reflections and gives you a better option to, to shoot the albedo. Um, but take care of the camera settings because the filter will reduce the brightness by one or even two units. So just use it when it is really necessary. Um, I also recommend a color checker to rec colors and also do reference shoots for having a look at how the material reacts with the light. It will help you to develop the material. Last but not least, I like to mention that I use also a mobile phone because I do not carry around the whole time a tripod with a big camera, but I always see a lot of materials I want to capture. So yeah, uh, the, the good advantage of a mobile phone is the small sensor that produces complete sharp images compared to the DSLR. Um, but take care of shooting a lot of close-ups to compromise the quality of the DSLR camera. And the last tip is to have enough memory and battery power. There's nothing worse than being far, far away from home and have a good spot for materials and you run out of these two important things. That's horrible. The next thing is the, the camera arrangement. You can see the, the lanes I walked while I captured the brick wall and you see some other cameras on the left side that have a longer distance to, to the object. They help with the alignment in the photogrammetry software. So this, this is a simpler view of it. Um, if, if, if you have problems with the alignment, these cameras uh, will help because they have something like an overview because they capture a bigger area of, of the object. One thing I like to, to tell is that when I reproject uh, the texture, I switch them off because the closer cameras have a better result when texturing is done. And what you see here is a dense cloud of a tree and uh, yeah, it's obviously the, the photogrammetry uh, software. And yeah, it generate a high poly of 500 to 800 million triangles, depending on the surface. It means that, that I take care of the, of the height or how much detail you, you, you see. So bark is, is one of the material with, with good peaks and valleys. So, so I go up to, to 600, 700 million triangles. And yeah, uh, after that, uh, I reduce it to a low poly model and place a plane with squared UVs. And in this example, I wrap it around the tree so the faces looks more straight to the object. And yeah, that, that helps with distortion. 
And yeah, the, the result, if, if you reproject everything, is that you have an albedo, uh, a height map, and a normal map. And uh, I take those maps and then hang them in Art Engine. For that, I prepared three examples. One example is the, the, the single image material creation, where we create some moss and lichen. Another is an example of how to mutate textures and get variations. Here we, we discuss how to, to mutate the, the Mediterranean tiles. And the, the last or the, the, the third one is a fabric that has a warping effect that we want to correct. And I can tell that the last one is not a photogrammetry uh, thing, it is a photometry thing. So uh, that is something I also will explain. So let us start. Here we have the single image material generation. And yes, just let's start. Uh, I took some, some pictures with my mobile phone and uh, just showing you here a quick overview and when you get from one image to, to a complete material in, with just a few nodes. So first, uh, I like to use the crop node to, to get a square texture by 2K, try to remove our shadows, sharpening a little bit if necessary. I uh, also like to reduce the, the gradient. You uh, can see this here with I know I'm switching from the input to the output that uh, it, I, it's flattening a little bit the, the image, uh, of course, but it's doing a great job. After that, I generate the additional maps, roughness, normal height, and AO, compose them to your material. And of course, you, you can tweak uh, the, 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 the notes uh, to, to generate different results for your normal height or, or whatever. And yeah, for, for now, of course, we have the problem that we have seams. Uh, we use the simple note seam removal. Uh, it's doing a great job, as you can see here. And uh, after that, of course, we have a repetition. And with the mutation node, you can get rid of it. Um, what I'm doing here is showing you that this is not just upscaling uh, the 2x2 the, the image I have here. Uh, I set it to, to 8K. So what, what it's doing is taking this, this structure and scattering it over 8K. So the, the output is not an upscaled version of, of the input. And you can use uh, the detail manipulators to, to decide what kind of details you, you like to, to manipulate. And uh, here we have one of the first examples, quick and dirty with a few nodes to, to generate moss and lichen. I have another example, which I like to show you here. Um, this is more looking like stone, but we have, as you can see, moss or, or lichen overall here. And uh, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, I, I tried to use the, the, the first steps in, in the same way, uh, taking the hard shadow removal, um, going back and forth. You see, it's uh, the, the, the dark spots get vanished. So this is a, a dream of removing light weighting while capturing uh, uh, the photogrammetry stuff. And uh, yeah, I really uh, like this note for, for, for using them in the beginning. Um, of course, crop it again to, to square by 2K, move the gradient a little bit, showing you this again. Uh, so yes, and after that, it's pretty forward like the same I did before, uh, but enhance a little bit the, the, the roughness map with a noise, just blend it together. So we have different results here. And for the albedo, um, sometimes I, I like to use the color muse. The, the color muse is uh, giving me some, some swatches so I get an idea of the whole image what kind of colors I have here. And uh, uh, I picked two images and decided to go with the green one and the yellow leaves. And yeah, as I said, the, the color is sometimes I just use for, for having uh, an overview for, for, the, for the color swatches. But, ah, grateful. 
Um, uh, what, what I did to, to enhance this, uh, to uh, taking the, the node color match, and what this color uh, match is doing, taking uh, the, the, the picture I decided uh, to, to, to transfer all the colors to my actual uh, picture. So here we see the, the result of transferring colors. And now we have a lot more of the Moss and Lichen idea for, for what I imagine for this material. After that, I'm bringing that together with the Compose Material node. And yeah, as you can see here, uh, I have all my additional maps. Uh, after that, I use the Mutation node. Uh, I decided to, to, to use the harsh and uh, coarse details. And also, uh, an important thing uh, I like to mention is the scale and orientation. This helps you a lot uh, to, to break up the pattern ID because it takes parts of the, the image and scale it up and down and rotated it uh, while it's scattering over the, the, the uh, 8K. And yeah, here we have another result uh, for, for a fast material creation for, for the example Moss and Lichen. Here we have another example of using Art Engine. I have a material which is called Mediterranean Tile here. This is a fake tile. You can see this by the structure. The color is printed onto the stone. And yes, I already have the additional maps here, which I composed two uh, material together. And yeah, uh, this is more uh, a directed manual approach to get variations. So I used mutation and stitching different pieces together by blending uh, them. And yeah, I mutated it four times until I was satisfied by the result. And uh, I corrected the place to, to, to each where it belongs to uh, when I like to blend this together. So this is the end result of what I did at this part here. And you can see we have seams and also spots which are repeating. You can get rid of this by just mass painting them. And yeah, here's a seam removal. So you can see the different results before and after. Yes. And that's it for, for the first thing. And what I wanted or what I had more in mind was an an idea of a more softened looking uh, stone. So what I did was using the, the height uh, map from the beginning and blend it with a different mutation together. Uh, so I have uh, uh, another mutation here, but as you can see, this is a total different ideation of, of what we have here in our base. That's because I used scale and orientation where you have different pieces of the, the, the structure. And this is scaling up and down and rotating and also mirroring these. So with these uh, manipulators, I, I have a different idea of the material. And this is what I use as a base for getting a more soft look. So you can see here the, 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 the material which I really like. And yeah, after that, I split the material again into different maps, uh, my additional maps, because I like to manipulate them. So uh, as the end result of the albedo, I use levels and use saturation to manipulate the, the color. So we have more intense colors for, for the end result. And I did something similar like with the roughness values. And also for the height, I used a histogram scan to define a little bit more the, the, the height map. And in the end result, I used emerged channels uh, where I put all gray value maps together in RGB. So I have a more compromised package of of my output for the vMaterials library. So this is more uh, a manual approach, as I said be before, because of course you can, can use mutation 
mutate until you want it. But the, the main idea was getting pieces which are like and just put them together. So yes, that's that's it. Here we have uh, a photometry case for a cloth material I captured. So there's no photogrammetry at all. The difference is that you do not take a lot of photos and run calculations until you get a polygon model out of it and do all the reprojection for the texture creation. For the photometry, you need a minimum of four images with a specific light setup, which you can see here. Each light needs a counter light, so you set up a camera and the only thing that moves is the light going around the spot you want to capture. And what I use is the multi-angle detection node here. And the result is an almost delighted albedo, and you also get a normal map. And yeah, after that, uh, I cropped it to, to a square. So uh, one thing uh, uh, you can see here is still some kind of vignetting and you will reduce the vignetting by using a gradient removal node. So you can see this back and forth. And after that, I do some adjustments with levels and sharpen. And after that, I create the additional maps. Uh, I like to mention the height generation, as you can see here. Um, because if you use the standard settings for the height generation, you will have a, a height map looking like that, and you can see bigger shells, and that's that's not the height uh, you want to use. So get rid of the harsh details, coarse details, and medium details, and only adjust fine and sharp details. So you will get a similar result, uh, which you can use for, for a really fine material like uh, a fabric material. And after you have the additional maps, uh, we compose it to a material together. Um, that's how it looks like for now. So the result is that we have a seam which we like to remove. And also you, you have a warping effect which you like to clean up. And for that, we like to use the mutation structure node. Uh, I like to show you this uh, uh, live. So let me create a mutation structure node. Here we go. And uh, what it is doing now is use uh, the pattern map. So you have to check the box. Uh, we don't like to have the auto definition because the, the detail of the pattern is, is, is too fine. So I like to, to do it by my hand. And for that, you have this rectangle. And what we are searching now is for a pattern, which is straight and not so much uh, distorted. So let me search for this thing. Here we can, here we can get a, a good result. <clears throat> so this one is uh, what I like to to interpret as as a good straight pattern. So press patch detection, and Art Engine is calculating. Now you can see Art Engine's output, where uh, Art Engine detected the pattern. So here we can see how it is distorted. And if you press now the execute button for the mutation structure node, this will be straightened by Art Engine. Here we go. We have a straightened fabric, and this is ready to use for, for a pullover, for example. So let's show you some practical examples of how May V materials look like. Um, I'd like to start with a very simple material like this plaster material that we have here. And aside from setting the plaster color, you can adjust the plaster brightness within, you know, a meaningful range. Also note that if you're adjusting the roughness of the plaster, you can see the highlight here that, you know, like even if it's set to zero, it's not uh, super uh, reflective. So we always take care that the parameters can be varied within meaningful range so that the look of the material does not break. 
Um, the special feature in this material is that we said, okay, we have plaster, we want to add some weathering effects. And as we dial in, you see that we have this wet dirt and grime layer that's being added on top. And well, if a, as a material ages, you know, it's getting old, it develops cracks. So you can dial in some slight cracks. I'll dial in a bit more and you see that we have now the cracks penetrating the surface of our material and depending on how prominent you would like to this effect to be you can also add the bump map so you really get the 3D structure of the cracks or you can keep it very subtle or you know completely turn it off so that's the plaster material example So this is the copper material that I've been showing at the beginning of our slides. And you can adjust the bumpiness of the copper surface. So like you can start with a really completely blank copper. And then you can change the roughness of the material so you can make it really look corroded. So it makes more sense to also increase the bumpiness so we can see the structure a bit more. And uh, the special feature is that we can have some corrosion grow, like some um, green copper rust on top of that. So, you know, you, you dial up that, the, the patina amount parameter and the material is covered in copper oxide and you can adjust the bump map of the copper oxide layer independently and also for the transition softness whether you'd like to have a rather hard transition set this to zero and you see like then it comes in uh, very quickly or you can make a, a soft transition so if you have the effect grow it's it's softer and it's more gentle and also additionally so let's um make make bring down the roughness you can have these scratches and wear marks so this is also independent of the rest of the materials. So you see that we offer a lot of parameters. So depending on how you'd like to your material to look, you have all these controls ready at your hand. In this example, we have the clinker brick material. Again, you can adjust the overall brightness of the bricks. You can have some mossy leaks, you know, flow down the bricks and change the brightness and the color of those. And uh, you, the special feature of this material is that you can have some um, paint applied on the material. So um, if you just dial it in a little bit, you see that the paint is not applied on the gaps between the bricks, but as soon as we bring it up to 100% or to one, you see that the entire material is covered. Um, if we don't, like the amount of paint strokes you can adjust the intensity so like here it's very roughly painted and here we have a very smooth paint applied and also you can change the reflectivity of the paint so let me show that with this highlight so it's very shiny here or you can have the paint uh, a more matte appearance if you'd like to have that and also finally if that paint is looking too new to you so you can add some some grime and some dirt so that we get back some aged and old look for that material. So that is the uh, clinker, the painted clinker material. Uh, here we have a, a wood material uh, where you can also change you know, the overall brightness of the wood. You can adjust um, the shininess of the, of the wood fibers which causes more of a stretched look of the highlights and you can apply some smudges to the material and some overall roughness of those smudges and finally apply a layer of dirt so to make this material not that perfect because you know while a couple of years ago it was always materials should always be shiny and slick like in photo real rendering very often you'd like to conceal the fact that it's rendered so it's always good to be able to um, add some layer of dirt and dust on top so and depending on how you how prominent you would like that effect to be you have the controls here in this material we've reached the end of our presentation to recap what we've presented today 
MDL allows us to build photoreal materials. And thanks to its ability to mix blend and layer BSDFs, we can build materials of any complexity. Using photogrammetry allows us to capture the real world and build high quality texture maps from these captures. Adding Art Engine to our production pipeline allowed us to produce the textures we are working with faster and more efficiently. If you're interested, you should check out Art Engine. It comes with a 14 day trial period. And if you're using any application that's capable of working with MDL, you should definitely check out the vMaterials catalog, which can be downloaded at no cost from the NVIDIA vMaterials webpage. Also, if you want to take a deep dive and learn about NVIDIA's material definition language, check out the MDL handbook under mdlhandbook.com, where you find detailed descriptions for writing your own MDL materials. So that's it. We've reached the end of our presentation. I'd like to say goodbye to everyone who has attended this webinar and wanted to say thank you for having invited us. See you next time. Bye.